Welcome to HA202 week 10. This week we explore the integumentary system. I am your instructor, Umnadia. Let's get started. What we will cover in this lecture. So this week, as always, we're going to be talking about herbs and their actions as it relates to the integumentary system, the forms, dosage, and also contraindications. We're also going to be talking about one of my favorite, another one of my favorite medicine making activities, which is bath teas. And we're also going to talk about some common ailments of the integumentary system, which include acne, herpes, psoriasis, and also sweating and body odor. Let's talk about some of the herbal actions of the herbs that we're going to study this week for the integumentary system. The first action is antiseptic, antimicrobial, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, anti-ulcer, anti-hydrotic. Now I want to talk about this one briefly. So when we think about anti-hydrotic herbs, we want to think about hydration, anti-hydrotic. So these herbs can act in two, two ways. So some anti-hydrotic herbs work internally and some of these herbs work externally. Let's talk about that. So anhydrotics are herbs that dry the tissues. So they remove excess water from the tissues. Now in TCM or traditional Chinese medicine, dampness is considered a disease causing factor, so a pathogen. So anhydrotics would be very beneficial in damp diseases or damp disease states um, because these herbs are designed to counteract dampness or drain dampness. They work in two major ways. So they have astringent properties, which means they are able to tighten or condense the tissues to squeeze out extra moisture. Uh, the tannins in these herbs are usually responsible for this action. And then the second way they work is by increasing the elimination of water from the body. So through the excretory system, through the kidneys and the bowels. So uh, think of diuretics and um, aqua, aquaretic herbs. They do this like um, senna, which we've talked about before, and also dandelion leaf. Now this week, we're going to be focusing on antihydrotic herbs that work externally because again we're talking about the integumentary system so these herbs are herbs that actually slow the production of sweat so again two different distinct you know ways that they can act internally externally this week we're focusing on the external uh, action the next action is anti-proliferative so this uh, action inhibits cancer to spread to other cells. So it, it stops the spread of uh, damaged cells cancer. So now let's take a look at the herbs that we're going to cover this week. The first is sage. Some of its actions include antiseptic, antihydrotic, antimicrobial, antiviral, and antispasmodic. The next herb is blueperum. Some of its actions include anti-ulcer, anti-inflammatory, anti-proliferative, and also immunomodulatory. The next herb for this week is lavender. Uh, this has the following actions, actions. so anti-psoriasis, very specific actions. Something I want to note here is when you see very specific actions, so actions that actually work on a specific disease, those actions have usually been studied scientific and given that specific action. And lavender, more specifically, lavender essential oil has been given this action. It's also anti-inflammatory because as we know, or as we'll learn in this lesson rather, psoriasis is a inflammation of the skin, which has a lot of underlying diseases, some of which we'll talk about this week, inshallah. And also it has wound healing properties. 
This week we will also cover time. Now time has the following actions. It's antispasmodic. It's also antimicrobial, astringent. It also has analgesic action, which means it, it's a great pain reliever. And also it's anti-inflammatory. Lastly, we're going to be talking about tea tree this week. Now, tea tree is one of those very strong antiseptic herbs, so it kills microbes on the spot. Some of those microbes include fungus and also bacteria. Now, just want to note something here. Sometimes you'll see the actions like antifungal, antibacterial um, separate, right? But really, we can put those both under the heading of antimicrobial. So microbes are uh, organisms that you can see under a microscope. Those organisms include bacteria, fungus, archaea, and also protist. Um, again, in a lot of the herbal texts, you'll see these actions broken down. A lot of that times, that's just to give you kind of a visual of how, you know, the potency and how strong and the actions, right, of the herbs. But we could, again, put it under the heading of antimicrobial. Now, antiviral is something separate because a virus is not a microbe. Just wanted to kind of point that out for you um, so that you don't get confused down the road when you see microbial sometimes. I want you to know that includes an umbrella of different types of microbes. And also tea tree is anti-inflammatory. Plant chemistry and the integumentary system. Let's make some connections. So what is the integumentary system and why is it important? First, let's look at the anatomy of the system. So we have the skin, of course, and we know that there are three layers of the skin, but we'll talk about the first two. First, there's the epidermis, which is the top layer of the skin. And then we have the dermis. That includes our sweat glands, our sebaceous glands, our hair follicles, blood vessels, and our nerves. So from a physical and mental standpoint, why is the system important? Firstly, it works along with the excretory system uh, to remove cellular waste from the body. And we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, in the lecture. Next, it works along with the nervous system to control our body temperature. And then last, it works along with our immune system to prevent pathogens from entering into the body. Now, from a you know physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional standpoint, this is just uh, just like the endocrine system we talked about last week. There's the soul, heart, mind, and body connection there. Uh, last week we talked about you know underneath it all. This week it's covering it all. Allah's divine signs. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions in the Quran the skin and let's listen to what he says about it فأصبحتم 
So the transliteration of these ayats, Allah is saying, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and remember the day that the enemies of Allah will be gathered to the fire. So they will be collected there, the first and the last, till when they reach it, the hellfire, their hearing, ears, and their eyes, and their skins will testify against them as to what they used to do. And they will say to their skins, why do you testify against us? They will say, Allah has caused us to speak as he causes all things to speak. And he created you the first time and to him you are made to return. And you have not been hiding against yourselves, lest your ears and your eyes and your skins testify against you. But you thought that Allah knew not much of what you were doing. And that thought of yours, which you thought about your Lord, has brought you to destruction, and you have become this day of those utterly lost. Now, in his tafsir, Ibn Qadir, rahimullah, he mentioned a hadith uh, after these ayahs, um, a hadith that was recorded by Imam Ahmed, rahimullah. And in this hadith, he recorded that Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I was hiding beneath the covering of the Kaaba, and three men came along, a man from the Quraysh and two of his brothers-in-law from Thakif or a man from Thakif and two of his brother-in-laws from the Quraysh. Their bellies were very fat and they did not have much understanding. They came and said some words I could not hear. Then one of them said, do you think that Allah can hear what we are saying now? The other said, if we raise our voices, he will hear it. But if we do not raise our voices, he will not hear it. The other said, if he can hear one thing from us, he can hear everything. I mentioned this to the prophet. Then Allah revealed the words and the transliteration. And you have not been hiding yourselves in the world, lest your ears and your eyes and your skin should testify against you until the uh, 23rd ayah of Surah Al-Fusilat, where Allah says of those utterly lost. And this was recorded by at tirmidhi among others, Rahim Allah. Again, this uh, was uh, included in Tafsir Ibn Qadir. What a beautiful uh, explanation right of these ayahs and not even to mention that the meaning of the surah in in english is uh the things explained in detail or things explained in detail we can see a lot from you these ayahs and also from this hadith 
um, for one, we can see that disbelievers, one of their characteristics are carelessness, right? They're careless. Listen to how Abdullah, radiallahu anhum, he, he talked about these men, right? He talked about their physical appearance, right? That was one of the first things that he did to describe them to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was describe their big bellies, right? This shows us a couple of things. It shows us how, you know, uh, the attention that the Sahaba gave to detail. Um, and also, uh, the, the Sahaba, those endued with knowledge, like Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, when they approached the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa not only can we see um, their level of understanding, you know, of and respect for the Prophet, uh, but we can also see uh, and how Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa responded to them, the things that mattered, you know, because the hadith are here as a part of guidance for us as Muslims. So when they went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa um, those with knowledge didn't want to waste his time. And they tried to relay and get understanding on matters and they would bring forth the details of the matters that they felt may be relevant in Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam giving them a you know a, a good uh, advice about it and in this case Abdullah radiallahu anhum was blessed to have ayahs revealed about this situation subhanallah so Firstly, he mentioned uh, that these people, right, they had these big bellies, right? That's really the only physical characteristic that he gave of them and that they had big bellies. This is characteristic. Remember, we talked about when we talked about the digestive system, I believe, about how Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the believer eats with just one intestine and the disbeliever eats with seven. So we know that you know, overindulgence, right, in things, not just food, but in, in sexual acts and uh, haram talk, right, haram actions is a characteristic, right, and this is carelessness on their, on their part, and this care, carelessness stems from another blameworthy characteristic that they have, which is ignorance of their Lord, because next, after he described their big bellies, Abdullah, radiallahu anhum, he talks about, you know, what they were saying, right? They said some words he couldn't couldn't hear, but Allah, Allah allowed him to hear the latter part of their uh, conversation where one was asking, do you think that Allah can hear what we're saying? Now, check out where they're at. These people were at the Kaaba, right? They were at the Kaaba having this conversation and they were they had a certain level of uh taqwa awareness of allah to even ask do you think allah can hear what we are saying right so whether they were muslim non-muslim or just disbelievers who because during that time um the paganism was rampant you know in mecca and so it's possible that they were pagans um, and they still believe that Allah is Allah, but they have some very deviant um, idol worshiping practices within their religion. Right. So that's possible. Right. I don't know the tafsir behind this this hadith <laughs> so um, or the, the, the further explanation behind this hadith. But what we can see here is that they had some level of awareness of Allah. Right. And they had some level of concern that he might be able to hear what, what they were saying. This is ignorance, right, um, which is widespread on the earth. Allah even tells us in the Quran that most people, he tells us in Surah ad dukan he tells us that most people don't know why they were created. They don't know why they're here. They don't know their purpose. And they don't know that because they haven't gotten to know Allah Right. They haven't given him his create, uh, correct or, or the appraisal that he deserves and that he hears. Right. He's a semi. He's a basir. He hears and he sees all things. Nothing is hidden from Allah. Even if we don't speak the words and we keep them in our chest, Allah knows it. Right. Nothing escapes Allah.
And so this is a, a sign of their ignorance and that they were whispering, asking each other if Allah could hear them, even with having a little bit of awareness of Allah, right? And then the one that answered last seemed to have even more. And he says, if he can hear one thing from us, he can hear everything, right? And then Allah sent down these ayahs, right, to these people who clearly were indulging, overindulging in life through food, right? And probably other vices because of their carelessness and ignorance of Allah, thinking that perhaps some things that they do are hidden. And so Allah's letting us know in these ayahs, nothing is hidden. Everything will be seen. You can't hide yourself in this world from Allah. You know, it, there's nowhere that you could go. You could go deep within the earth. You could go to the highest mountain and hide yourself in a cave. You will never escape death. You will never escape Allah. And so many times we can see this behavior repeated even in the ummah where and and it's so unfortunate right but this is the time that we live in may Allah guide us all may he guide his ummah and that some of us have awareness of Allah we have various awareness of Allah but for some reason perhaps the disconnection from Allah's names the lack of understanding his names the lack of understanding the prohibitions right we believe that perhaps some of our deeds are being hidden or because we're not being punished for them at that time that we are okay but the disbelievers take this far away and then sometimes Allah will give them things to keep them busy and they think that they're getting the bounties of Allah because they're blessed and because they're good and because Allah has forgiven them right but this Allah has designed these things to push people farther away from him because if a person thinks they're okay and they think that they're forgiven, they won't ask for forgiveness. They won't reflect upon their behaviors. They won't take this self assessment, right? They'll indulge and overindulge because they have the means to. Allah sometimes grants them the mean to, right? And so they'll all overindulge and they think that they're being rewarded and perhaps so. But just in this life, but in the next life, they'll get what I like to think of as a health report, right? And that's that's when our skins, right, all of us, our skins will testify against these evil things that we've done. May Allah keep us safe. So it's important to take the self-assessment health-wise on a spiritual, physical, emotional, mental level before we go to Allah and repent for our, our faults right and not to be like the one that Allah sometimes allows to go far in their trespasses without repentance oppressing others lack of fear of Allah but yet they may be getting the bounties of Allah but imagine the scary day when even their skins will testify against them may Allah keep us safe from that I mean so now we get to covering it all, Allah's divine signs. So we know that the skin is the largest organ on the body. It is also the first line of defense uh, for us against physical threats. So those threats can be people or even microscopic or viral pathogens. It also regulates a lot of our bodily functions as a matter of fact all of our bodily functions and that's because this sense of perception that Allah has given our, sin, our our skin right we can sense when we're in danger which sets off certain hormones to go through our body like adrenaline um, that triggers that flight or flight um, reflex um, also uh, it can let us know when we are not you know at 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 harm in harm's way um it can also uh, alert our body to pathogens that have entered in through the skin so that our body can you know our immune system can start a immune response to protect us so all of these beautiful functions that Allah has given our body 
again, as I mentioned, I like to look at, you know, uh, this as a part, an important part of our wellness report or our record, right? That we'll get and prayerfully in our right hands on the day of judgment. I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, that Allah will accept our striving, forgive us for our mistakes and help us give us the tawfiq to be successful in implementing what we're learning here and sharing it with others so that we will get our record in our right hand and we will be able to go to that blessed meeting and hear Allah say to us and all the believers that, you know, he is pleased with your striving. He's pleased with you. He's pleased with us. I mean, I mean, I mean. Also, you know, this is a beautiful sign of Allah and just how he structured our skin. We know that our skin has three layers and it's so important for us because it's a we constantly have to purify our skin and specific parts of our bodies um, with water right that shows us the constant need for purification of this body spiritually and physically and how and those actually have an emotional and mental uh, effect right because we know that when we do the will do and we do it completely for the sake of Allah every drop of water as it drops down it sins minor sins falling off of us this is the importance of prayer it keeps us clean from one prayer to the other of these minor sins and it also keeps us physiologically and spiritually clean as well right so it, it, it promotes homeostasis in the four domains also, we know that the uh, an important uh, uh, function of the skin is the remover of waste. And a lot of that is done through, through our capillaries. Um, now, there are no capillaries located in the epidermis, but they are located in the upper layer of the dermis. Now, the capillaries, they serve an important function. You know, when it comes to nourishing the lowest layers of the epidermis, they do that by a process called diffusion. Now, diffusion provides nourishment again for the epidermis, uh, epidermis, excuse me, and also the dermis. So this process removes um, waste from the, the cells and um, it removes uh, harmful pathogens. So it works to promote, again, homeostasis. And so when we think about this, think about cupping. We know that that is one of the Sunnah remedies that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was very constant in getting cupping done on himself, recommending cupping to others. And that's because the capillaries, they serve a lot of functions within the body. But one of those functions is like gas exchange, right? And um, We'll talk about this a little bit deeper in our next course. So when we look at the spiritual, emotional, mental, and um, physical energetics of disease, I hope I mentioned them all. Okay, so when we talk about that in our next course, inshallah, we're going to talk about jinn possession a lot and how jinns enter and exit the body. Gas is a huge, plays a huge factor in that. Um, as a matter of fact, if any of you do Rukia or has had it done, you know that a comp common symptom of um, gin possession is flatulence, so the passing of gas. Um, we'll talk more about that, but the capillaries serve a huge function in releasing harmful uh, accumulations of gas in the body. So some people wonder, you know, how is cupping effective? right? How is cupping effective when you're not even going deep into the skin? As a matter of fact, when you cup, you think about an orange, which is usually how you train for cupping. So you take an orange and then you take a, um, a, a surgical razor and then you kind of just do light little slits. You know, you don't want to, to pierce the skin too deeply. That's all that it takes to reach the, um, to reach the dermis, right? To release blood from the capillaries there. And, you know, we know that if a if a person is fasting, this process has so many spiritual implications to where their fast isn't even valid anymore if they get cupped, uh, nor is the fasting valid for the person who does the cupping. And that's because of all of the spiritual implications. It's a waste removal, not just physically, but also, you know, not just physically because it's blood, but also because 
the things that's being released spiritually. And then lastly, I want to mention that, you know, our skin is so important because it will be the organ again, the largest organ that will speak the undeniable truth about us and against certain uh, ones from Allah slaves. May Allah keep us safe from our skin speaking against us. Now, we know that there are three characteristics Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us of the hypocrites. And one, he said um, that when he speaks, he lies. And Two, when he gives a promise, he breaks it. And three, when he's trusted, he betrays. And this was narrated in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. Now, one thing about this hypocrite who does these things, who, who lies, they have a, a habit of forgetting the lies that they told because this is their character, right? And so if it's not true, then it's easy to forget because usually truth stays with us if it's something we've actually experienced, right? Truth stays with us, you know, when it's something we've actually experienced. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the heart is content on seeing proof. Also, you probably, if you have children who are at the age of puberty or beyond, or even if you think back to when you were at the age of puberty till now, right? You can probably think of instances where your parent told you something and gave you some valuable knowledge, or you perhaps read something from your Lord in the Quran, but it wasn't until you experienced that situation uh, that you were able to fully understand, have a deeper understanding and a deeper appreciation for that knowledge that you were given, right? Well, the person who lies, they don't have that connection of reality to what they're saying. So because of our nature, we're naturally forgetful, we're insane, they don't have that mechanism to keep them reminded, right? Uh, because their life is, is baseless, meaningless. You know, and I'm talking about the person that this is their character, habitually does this over and over again. So they don't have that. So they are just like floating particles of dust almost, right? Wherever they land, they land. They don't remember where they were before. So you might have someone and, you know, they can look you in the face. So you may have experienced a person like this. They look you right in the face and they've told you something about a situation that happened before. And now they're telling you a whole other story about the same situation. And they look totally convinced. This is because they they constantly forget. There's no experience, no truth tied to what they're saying. So they are just invested in the moment of telling a great story, right? These people will actually get before Allah as well and tell Allah, right? And this is also in Tafsir Ibn Kathir. Um, if you look in this section um, of these ayahs that we were talking about today in Surah Al-Fusilat, um, ayahs 19 through 23, if you look in the Tafsir, Right before the hadith that I mentioned on the previous slide, Allah talks about when these people will come before him. These people will even forget so much what they did in this life. They will even go to Allah with that behavior. They will stand before Allah and swear that they did no wrong. Swear that they were good people. Swear that they never oppressed people. They will do this and they will give a convincing account, right? And then they will ask Allah, subhanAllah, the boldness, right? They will ask Allah to let nobody else, like no one else be a witness against them except themselves. They they, they want to be the only one. <laughs> this is boldness, a stuck for Allah. May Allah keep us far away from this type of arrogance, right? They will be the only ones that they want to talk to Allah and tell the story of how things really went, how great they were, how they never lied, how they never did wrong, right? Because they were used to that in this world. And guess what? It worked for them in this world. 
it worked for them. So again, sometimes a law opens up so many doors for these people. And sometimes, you know, I've heard, I've had clients come to me and they just completely devastated. And they say, you know, this person oppressed me so badly there, you know, they did this, they did that, they harmed me in this way, they stole from me in this way. But I'm going through all these trials in my health and this person is rich. Or this person, you know, they got married again. You know, or this person, they, they go naming all of these bounties of a law, right? This is why Allah tells us in the Quran to be patient and to trust him, have to walk go, right? Because your situation could be removing sins from you, but their situation could be driving them deeper into transgression. Again, when they everything's going right, they feel they don't have a need to repent, Right? They don't have a need to turn back to Allah. They feel sometimes they are self-sufficient. And so we have to separate, right? And that's, you know, clinically, um, that is the hardest part for some clients. That's the hardest part. But I won't get too far into that. But just know that these people, if they even have the boldness and Allah tells us, because remember, Allah is time. So he knows everything that's, that has happened in the past and everything that's going to happen, right? He knows who's going to walk into his Jannah. He knows what their trial is going to be over as Sarat. He knows uh, what's going to be said on the judgment day. It's already happened in Allah's time. We're the ones having to go through the process, being here trying to have a good end, right? So... With that being said, again, these people will even go before Allah wanting to tell their story and be the only witness, right? They don't want any witnesses to their crime. So they want to be the only person that tells it because the story's got them away so much in this life. But guess what Allah will do? He will allow them. He say, okay, well, today you can be your only witness. <laughs> you see, pan Allah, right? You can be your only witness. And then he will seal their mouth shut. And that's when the skins will testify, the skins that was present during the oppression, right? Whether it was a, a, a strike with the hand or with the whip or the, the pull of a gun, may Allah keep us safe from these evildoers, I mean. Whether it was some other type of, of, of oppression that the skins were forced to do because it's connected to this person, right? Or whether, you know, it stole or consumed haram meat. Whatever the skins did, there's a full record, a full record that the systems, right, the organs will, you know, conf they will be the witnesses. They will be the witnesses. So the skins will testify and then those organs, those hormone release from the endocrine glands, the intestines will testify, right? from what you ate, they, they will be the witnesses, all connected to that person. So that day, the undeniable truth will be told. So I like to use this as an example for my clients sometimes, and I hope that it benefits you because it benefits me when I, when I go over it. And that don't worry about what people have done to you, right? Don't worry about what they have so much. Know that the people who tell you lies in this life and so blatantly sometimes lie to your face and you know that they're lying and the people that sometimes not just lie to you but go tell lies about you to other people and distort the truth and get away with it right turn perhaps turn your children against you turn your relatives against you they will have their day before Allah and all the truth will be told it seems like it's a, a, a long time for us in this life, but the Sahaba used to remind each other often, just a few more days, It's just a few more days. So I encourage you, I remind myself to be patient, be patient. And those with knowledge knows that, you know, things are not always what they look like. So that's covering it all, Allah's divine signs. Let's talk about ailments of the integumentary system. So the first ailment we're gonna talk about today is acne. What is acne? 
So acne is actually very common. It's a skin condition that happens when the hair follicles under the skin become clogged. Now, the hair follicles are located in the epidermis and the dermis, and what happens is oil and dead skin actually get into the pores and it causes outbreaks. So a person that has um, acne can actually have different presentations of acne. So sometimes you'll see lesions, sometimes it's more pimple-like, um, and sometimes those pimples may be filled with pus. Um, and that's because, and it really depends on what's inside of those lesions. So bacteria, sweat, and, and again, oil and dead skin can plug those areas and cause different presentations of acne. So most often, um, acne outbreaks occur on the face, but it can occur anywhere on the body. So if you have a client, they're coming, they're presenting rashes, uh, keep in mind that it could be acne on, you know, presenting on a different part of the body. So there's different ways that, you know, acne can be uh, diagnosed. And usually, you know, it's just kind of a, a visual observation, um, asking about a person's family history, um, because genetics could play a part. Um, also, uh, hormone imbalances can play a part. So especially when you have like preteens, it's very common in people under their 30. So acne usually clears up um, after a person, you know, reaches the age of 30 and beyond. But before that, especially in the preteen phase, you'll see a lot of acne happening and that's because of puberty. And so asking about these things, especially if you're you know, trying to do a consultation with someone remotely um, is very helpful because you can kind of get an idea. Also, acne can reappear during menopause for women, again, because of hormonal changes. Also, asking about symptoms um, and also uh, acne can come about because of you know, certain medications that a person is taking that causes the excess of skin to, um, of dead skin or skin regeneration at a quicker rate rather um, than normal, uh, and which can cause those pores to, to clog up. And also some medications can cause, you know, oily skin as well. Um, so this is usually, acne is usually di uh, diagnosed by um, a person's dermatologist. So that's a person who specializes in conditions of the skin, hair, and nails, or a person's primary health healthcare provider. Um, so a, a doctor, an internist, a pediatrician um, can also usually diagnose acne. Um, again, it's very common, so something widely seen. So um, become familiar with the different presentations of acne uh, just so you know how to go about identifying it and also treating it. Now there are again different types of acne. I'm not going to go into a huge detail here um, but we've all probably heard of whiteheads. So this is a type of acne um, that stays where the um, where the lesions and pimples actually stay under the skin and produces a white bump. Again, that's called a whitehead. Um, also, you'll have some acne that actually reach the surface of the skin and open up, and these are called blackheads. You'll see some appear as small pink bumps on the skin. They can be very tender to the touch. Um, again, some of them have that white or yellow pus-filled lesions. Um, some, some acne can be really localized on the face, so maybe just in a patch. Some can be just like, you know, all over, like a widespread area over the face or other parts of the body. So again, very common, but different presentations. And um, it can be kind of tricky to diagnose, um, especially if you're not familiar with the other uh, ailments of the skin that we're going to talk about uh, momentarily. So that is acne. So now let's talk about psoriasis. So what is psoriasis? 
uh, firstly, let me introduce you to the page that we're on. As you can see, we are at the Mayo Clinic website. I enjoy this website and I definitely want to refer you to it to learn about different diseases. Um, it's a great, they give a great overview of various diseases and then they also provide references where you can go and see the peer-reviewed research papers um, that they base their overview on. So what is psoriasis? Uh, firstly, let me introduce you to the page that we're on. As you can see, we are at the Mayo Clinic website. I enjoy this website and I definitely want to refer you to it to learn about different diseases. Um, it's a great, they give a great overview of various diseases and then they also provide references where you can go and see the peer-reviewed research papers um, that they base their overview um, upon. So uh, again, a great resource. Here we're looking at, again, psoriasis. So what is it? Psoriasis, just like acne, is a very common skin ailment. So it causes, you know, different than acne, it presents a little bit different and that uh, it causes red, itchy, scaly patches on the skin. And these uh, presentations usually happen in a certain part of the body. So we'll see those happen in knees, um, the, on the elbows, uh, the trunk, and also the scalp. Now, Western medicine says that this is a long-term chronic disease, no cure. We know in Islamic medicine that is not true. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that Allah says for every disease he sent down, he also sent a cure. So um, as you'll see with psoriasis, it is a, it's not just the physical presentation as no disease is, but it has some deeply spiritual uh, implications. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about psoriasis. So um, psoriasis again can cause these patches uh, they can come and go so they go through pa phases of you know activity and then they go into remission and the reason for that is though uh, is because even though we are talking about psoriasis as a ailment of the intercumitary system it is actually an autoimmune disease right so it's a disease of the uh, immune system and also the nervous system um, we're going to talk about how that is when we talk about the different forms of psoriasis because there are quite a diff uh, quite uh, a varied um, list of types of psoriasis um, but just know that it is a autoimmune disease and remember an autoimmune disease uh, means that the that the body's immune system becomes overactive and so it attacks itself so we have different presentations as i mentioned and uh, another reason why we're on mayo clinic's website is because they have awesome pictures so we can see exactly what it looks like and this is really good when you get into your clinicals to have this as a resource so when you have clients you can kind of look at real pictures from clinical practice of what these um, presentations look like. And so one of the first types of um, psoriasis is something called plaque psoriasis. So this is actually the most common form. And this is this first picture that we see here. Now with plaque psoriasis, it causes dry, raised red skin that's usually very, very itchy, um, very like irritating. Um, Sometimes you'll see this, you know, a lot of times it presents on the arms, on the hands, and it can be very frightening if you see it in real life. Um, I've seen it quite a, a few times, but um, these things are not contagious whatsoever. Again, this is the person's immune system attacking itself. So it's something that's going on internally. Again, usually very itchy tender very painful sometimes to um, the person that has it because they start to itch which can open up those uh you know those plaques on the arms and you know start burning and introduce other back you know other pathogens into that site which can cause inflammation and a host of other diseases um the next uh, type of psoriasis is something called uh, guttate psoriasis. So this primarily affects young children and adults, and that's 
the picture that we have here. Um, it's usually triggered by a, an infection, a bacterial infection in particular. So you'll see this a lot with patients that have staph in, or strep throat, excuse me, strep throat. Um, and you see, you know, a, a, maybe a child presenting with uh, this type of, you know, skin irritation. It could be a symptom of strep throat, especially if it's accompanied by a fever and a sore throat. So these, this type of psoriasis, is, 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 its characteristics um, are small, drop-shaped um, lesions, usually happening on the lower back, the arms, the legs, the upper body, the neck. Um, next, we have something called inverse psoriasis. Where is that? Okay, so I'm not going in order here, but here's inverse psoriasis. And what this is, it, is it mainly affects the skin in the folds you know, skin that, that's in the between the folds of something. So like in the groin area, um, the buttocks, and also right under the breast, as in this picture. Now, um, this type of psoriasis actually pre presents in very smooth patches. So you won't see like the raised kind of bumpy presentation with that. It's usually very, very, it's like smooth skin, but you can tell it's like discolored from the rest of the body. Um, this is something that, you know, um, kind of pours into when we're going to talk about um, sweating in a few minutes, inshallah. But sweating um, can be uh, in friction because these, you know, this presents in the folds of the skin can make it worse. Um, and also fungal infections because of the sweating and because it, you know, it presents in a creased area um, of the body can lead to fungal infections, which can make the psoriasis, it can trigger an evil, even worse um, uh, uh, episode. So, you know, when you're thinking if you decide to, you know, or if you have to make a client, a uh, product for a client that has um, inverse psoriasis, you're going to want to think about um, something that could keep them dry, um, something that may, you know, will keep out water, um, so prevent water, um, and something that would be non-irritating because of the location. So you might think in, uh, in terms of fine herbal powder mixture or, or something of that nature just to give an idea i mean we will talk in deep detail about things like this when we get to product design um, but just want to keep you always thinking about the nail and then also um, thinking forward okay so the next type of psoriasis is something called and I want to follow along with their pictures, but so let me back up. Um, something called scalp psoriasis. So, you know, just like it, it sounds, this is something that happens in the scalp. Um, a lot of times it presents like our plaque psoriasis. So it's like these, you know, thick um, sil uh, silvery scales, right? Um, causes a lot of itching just kind of like which can turn into a rash um, and, and sometimes it can cause hair loss as well. Next we have um, something called nail psoriasis. Now we talked back in IH 101 about being in tune with our bodies, looking at our tongue, you know, as you know, for symptoms of disease but our nails can tell us a lot about different types of diseases, particularly psoriasis, okay? So psoriasis can affect the, the fingernails, it can affect the toenails, um, it, can, it can cause something called pitting, where the nail actually looks like it's scooped in, uh, it looks like it's scooped in. Um, I had a client like uh, that had this before and it literally, the nail, I wish I had a picture of it. This is not, uh, this is not pitting what we're seeing here on the skin. But if you can imagine, imagine taking a, the nail off, right? And putting your thumb right in the middle of your nail to kind of do an indention, so to speak, to where you have the edges of the nail going upward in the middle pressed in, and then putting that nail back on the finger. Literally, that is what pitting looks like. Um, and it's a sign of psoriasis. So sometimes, you know, you might have a client and um, because uh, these skin ailments come with a lot of shame. P 
people are ashamed, um, particularly, especially if they've grown up with this, people think they're contagious. And so it brings about shame. So some people like to cover themselves and you would never know that they have psoriasis if they didn't tell you. Um, but the fingernails is a good sign of that. And I mentioned this not because you want to go and investigate people and, and things like that and make assumptions. No, but I mentioned this because, you know, sometimes we come across clients and sometimes when a client is you're in that trust building phase, they might not want to disclose everything about themselves, right? When you're, even when you're doing consultations and you're, um, you're asking them questions, um, they may not want to disclose things about themselves completely um, or they may not think of that this particular ailment that they are suffering from has anything to do with their current symptoms if that makes sense so they may leave something out well that's where you come in being someone who's skilled and trained you can take visual cues when you do your you know initial assessments so the nails can tell us a lot about um, psoriasis so again, can cause that peeling, it can cause abnormal nail growth and also discoloration. So with psoriatic, uh, psoriatic nails, um, these nails could actually loosen and separate from the nail bed. And so what happens is the nail actually at right at the tip kind of separates from, from the nail bed. So the bottom part of the nail where the cuticle is, is still connected, but the top of it is raised. That is a sign of um, psoriasis. And also in very severe cases, the nail can completely come off. So it can crumble to pieces, um, which is a sign. But this is what we're seeing on this uh, screen is uh, this is like, you know, um, a very not severe case, but definitely a presentation of nail psoriasis. So next, um, we have something called postular psoriasis. Now with this, this is actually rare so we don't see this a lot um, this causes like acne so you'll have those pus filled lesions that occur in widespread patches um, they can occur on the palms of the hands uh, the soles uh, or the soles of the feet um, <clears throat> next we have something called etherodermic psoriasis and that's actually this is actually very you know it's the least common so it's not very common um, it can cover the whole body with a red peeling rash and it can be intensely painful um, and, and and burn another one that I wanted to talk about was psor um, psoriatic um, arthritis now this causes swollen painful joints and I don't know if they have a picture of this on no they don't have a picture of this one but this one is this is how we can see the immune, you know, the autoimmune, um, I guess, um, the autoimmune, how, how this is an autoimmune disorder. So, um, it's, it's an arthritis. Again, it causes swollen, painful joints, um, just like you would see in, you know, any other type of arthritis. Um, sometimes the joint symptoms are the only or first symptom of psoriasis. So they may not get the, the uh, lesions. They may not get the, um, you know, the, the smooth patches or anything. It just may be joint pain. Sometimes just nail changes are seen. Um, these symptoms can be mild they can you know be severe um, and it can affect any joint in the whole body it can cause stiffness and progressive joint damage um, and in serious cases it can lead to permanent joint damage so this is because right this is because it's an autoimmune problem right it causes the skin to well in psoriasis the skin regenerates at a faster than normal rate right and and this is especially um, the in the case of plaque psoriasis so we have this rapid turnover of cells remember we talked about plaque psoriasis
So again, these cells are super important when we think about uh, ailments affecting the integumentary system like psoriasis and also um, you know, ailments that affect this system and also the nervous system and in the, in the immune system. So I've included some wonderful research in your download section this week. Um, they won't be mandatory readings because this will be more like things that we will so again, these cells are super important when we think about uh, ailments affecting the integumentary system like psoriasis and also um, you know, ailments that affect this system and also the nervous system and in the, in the immune system. So I've included some wonderful research in your download section this week. Um, they won't be mandatory readings because this will be more like things that we will approach when we get to our uh, product design classes. But it's great for you just to have this information and if you have time to go ahead and look over it. But this particular paper that you see up now is, uh, it talks about the role of Langerhans cells in epidermial homeostasis and also um, the pathogenesis, so the origin of psoriasis. It's very detailed. I mean, it gives you the whole pathophys pathophysiology um, of the disease. It talks about what the disease are, is, all the uh, you know different types. Uh, it tells you about the origin of the disease and the Langerhans cells. It just gives you detail information to understand again the pathogenesis the pathophysiology um, of the you know the the disease um, you know in reference to its progression um, on a cellular level which is always great information to know because when you're designing products you can design So this is another really good piece of research. This was an article that was published in the Journal of Experimental Medicine back in 2009 um, that researched Langerhans cell proliferation, so the spread of these cells and how it affects neonatal development, homeostasis, and also inflammation. So just something really good to keep in mind and reference uh, in the future, especially again, when we get to our product design courses, inshallah. Uh, but just knowing that the Langerhans cell specifically for psoriasis is a great treatment um, uh, goal. So whenever we think about designing medicine, we this is why we study anatomy. This is why we study um, physiology. So we can know not only, you know, the mechanisms of action um, for our herbs, right? We also want to know the, you know, the pathogenesis of disease, the pathophysiology. So how disease starts um, and how it progresses, right? So we need to understand this because we want to have therapeutic targets um, that we target. And Langerhans cells, again, when we think about psoriasis, is a good uh, therapeutic target. Um, even in Western medicine, it's a therapeutic target for psoriasis and other ailments that affect the integumentary system um, like eczema um, and, uh, and also for ailments that affect the immune system and nervous system. So this multi-system, um, you know, how the diseases that affect multi-systems and we know in Islamic medicine, all diseases affect all of our systems and besides that you know they affect us spiritually mentally and emotionally as well so that's the beauty of what we are doing here and that we are learning uh, inshallah uh, medicine uh, in a, a more complete way than in Western medicine but in Western medicine um, Again, they know the effect of reaching the Langerhans cells, and so you'll usually see um, uh, steroids 
topical steroids um, to address that or to reach that target uh, goal or that uh, treatment area. So the linger hand cells. Uh, the, the problem with steroids are, you know, besides them being synthetic medicines that our bodies weren't designed to respond to um, and being full of poisons and toxins, um, they have a serious effect on the endocrine system. So hormonal dysregulation, you'll see that a lot in clients who have had a history of using steroids, um, particularly topical steroids, and that their hormonal functions are off later on in life. Um, and so sometimes they experience, you know, early menopause, um, reproductive issues, um, a whole host of ailments because of the side effects of ster steroids and also a lot of nervous and immune system deficiencies. So you'll see people who are on steroids um, and you see this a lot in eczema patients, especially uh, people who have like widespread eczema. They usually have a lot of allergies, allergic to everything. And doctors tell them sometimes like, it's because of your allergies that is, you know, a triggering for your eczema but really what happens is that um, yeah they probably have undiagnosed allergies but it's an immune system and nervous system uh, along with the intergumentary system ailment so this multi-system um, disease right and so uh, what happens is when they start to because they're not addressing it holistically right? When they start using steroids, it weakens, it may lessen some of the physical presentations of eczema, but the person becomes very sickly. Their immune system is, is very weak, right? Um, they stay allergic to a whole host of things. So you're not really treating, you're putting on this toxic band-aid and you're worsening and weakening other systems they become dysregulated um, and then you cause the um, pathogenesis of a new disease in the endocrine system so so again just something great to keep in mind that when we are you know looking at different diseases as islamic medicine practitioners uh, as islamic herbal medicine practitioners we should be thinking about um, you know, these different, uh, you know, not just our mechanism of actions of our herbs, but also how these mechanisms of action should affect a particular, particular, uh, target or treatment target within the body based upon the pathophysiology, uh, the progression of that particular disease. So again, these downloads, um, and I think I may have included a couple of other, other just beneficial articles because sometimes when I'm researching, I find like new articles that came out that I didn't read before and I'll throw them in your download section. So always check, double check, because sometimes I may not list it there in the download section, but it's there. So if you have the ability, I would highly recommend that for um, every week you print out everything and just stick it in a binder binder um, if it's not a required reading just have it there so when the class ends and you get that little two-week break um, that we do inshallah you can go back and you can review that information and get a deeper understanding of the um, the topics that was presented during the course inshallah so now let's talk about genital herpes. So what is herpes? So herpes is actually a very common, or genital herpes rather, is a very common sexually transmitted infection. So common being the word. The reason why I bring this up is because we have to destigmatize um, people with genital herpes. Um, Again, it's very common and most people don't even know that they have it because when they contract it, it 
can lay dormant in their system for years before the disease starts to present itself through maybe pain or itching, um, small red bumps or tiny white blisters. Um, also ulcers can form and these form when the blisters um, actually rupture and ooze um, or bleed. And this can make it very painful for the people that have it and it can cause scabs. So once it's about to heal, because this disease has periods of activity and remission, because this can be considered an autoimmune disease as well, um, because it, it lies in our nerve fibers, um, usually like in the lower back is where that happens. But <clears throat> so again, it's important, you know, as Islamic medicine practitioners, that we destigmatize de this uh, disease. For one, it's very common, but it is sexually transmitted. So, you know, when you think about genital herpes, you think about like lewd behavior, but that's not all the way, always how a person can contract it. So it is a sexually transmitted disease. So I'll give you an example. So with uh, genital herpes, it's uh, common and it's caused by the HSV2 um, virus. So there's a HSV1 and this usually causes cold sores like around the mouth or sometimes inside of the mouth. Um, now here's the thing. HSV2 is the genital part. So that usually happens below the waist. So it can present on a person's back, on their private parts. It can even appear like on the inside of the leg. So it's not always like right on the private area. It can, it's considered that, you know, below the app, below the, um, below the waist. So you think about the navel, you kind of do a circle around to the back. So that area and down is where, you know, genital er herpes. Um, a person can contract genital herpes, you know, from a person that has, uh, you know, the HSV1 virus. So they may have cold sores and that person may, you know, have transmitted it to a person in a lawful situation. Um, and now they have genital herpes. So it's pre presenting genitally. So when we see genital herpes, again, we have to destigmatize it because sometimes it's not always in a, you know, lewd fashion that it's transmitted. And again, it's very common. A lot of people, men and women, women are common, you know, very common car car carriers of it, excuse me. Um, but a lot of people don't know they have it because they're asymptomatic. You know, you can literally have this laying dormant in your body seven, ten years. Some people show no symptoms whatsoever, ever, right? Or some people have rashes, like in a weird place. Maybe they have rashes that appear on their buttocks or maybe on their lower back or maybe their inner thigh. And they may say it's because my clothes are rubbing or it's because I sweat a lot in that area. Um, so, um, again... Uh, some people literally don't know that they are carriers of this virus, but most people are um, carriers of it, of it, and it's very contagious. So it can spread to a person who's not infected very easily, even if a person is not having an actual active breakout. Um, so awareness of the person who may have it proactive and getting a diagnosis is super important. Something else that I want to mention about this is that um, herpes can mimic other diseases. So it can, you know, look like acne. Um, it can look like psoriasis. It can also look like, what is that other one? Supanola. I don't know why it's uh, slipping my mind right now. Uh, I'll come back to it, but can, it can very commonly mimic another one. Um, la ilaha illallah. Inshallah, we'll come back to it. But let's talk a little bit more. A woman who has genital herpes and she's having an active breakout, um, it's important for her to, you know, be on um, mild 
herbs that are safe for her, especially right before she's about to give birth and throughout the pregnancy, if possible. Sometimes you cannot administer certain herbs over, you know, a long period of time. So some herbs have, you know, it says don't use um, more than four weeks consecutively or more than six weeks consecutively. So usually a woman who wants a natural treatment and who is prone to breakouts um, because a triggering event for herpes breakouts being that it is an autoimmune disorder is stress. So pregnancy and labor is very stressful. So you'll find women who do have breakouts, especially right up before they give birth when their body is changing and getting ready to deliver, um, they will have breakouts. Now, it's very dangerous for a child because they can, you know, they can acquire uh, herpes and they can also, um, you know, it can affect the eyes, so it can cause blindness or um, sight difficulty, vision difficulty. So it's very important um, to, uh, and it can also cause brain damage, you know, some serious complications of this is disease. So women who are seeking natural treatment and they have this should definitely be treated with a lot of care. Um, also, um, I just wanted to make sure I meant it was a, quite a few things that I wanted to mention about this. I want to make sure I touched on it all. Yes. Yeah, so um, some other complications of herpes and it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's one of those ones that can cause a, a whole lot of, you know, ailments within the body, but it's difficult because a person, again, they may not know. So, and you can't diagnose what you don't see and what you don't know. So a person could be presenting with a group of symptoms and, but they may be asymptomatic, but be a carrier of, um, you know, herpes you know, HSV2. So um, it can cause, make the body more susceptible to other sexually transmitted diseases, again, because of those open sores um, and also um, because of the weakened immune system. It can cause bladder infections. Um, and that's because, you know, it can cause like, you know, the virus causes uh, infections in other parts of the body. Um, just a host of, of things, but um, I included some reading information about herpes in your download section. Um, this is a good point here to make um, because a lot of people, um, they want natural remedies for these type of ailments, but there's so much, there's so much stigma around it that people usually go and do their own research and they'll get on certain drugs or supplements like minerals, L-lysine is one of them, and they'll start taking that, right? But they're doing it in an untrained fashion. And so perhaps herpes, right, is um, being triggered by another ailment in the body. Um, or perhaps they don't know, you know, that they have herpes, but they may be taking certain su supplements that's triggering um, or can potentially cause it to worsen and trigger outbreaks that they never had before. So a lot of people, what will happen is those who do know, again, they go and do their own research and they get on certain herbs that can have, um, that can be more harmful to them than helpful. Um, because again, they're not approaching it holistically. There may be other systems involved, other diseases involved, spiritual as aspects. And so, you know, but they're afraid to talk to someone because of all of the stigma. So not just with herpes, but there are other diseases like this that cause uh, people a lot of shame. Um, and as Muslims, you know, we don't want to expose our faults, even if they're past faults. And even if we're not guilty of something and we contracted it in a way that, you know, we weren't guilty in that situation, it's, it's difficult to relay that information. And so I like to always make sure that I teach empathy, you know, and this is with any disease. Empathy is first, you know, and um, see a person pass their faults. Um, because when a person comes to you, they're looking for resolution. They're looking for help. Um, they're looking for guidance. And, you know, 
um, this is an opportunity to help. So you may have people that, you know, they come to you with different ailments and unless they're an emergency situation, right? They are not going to the, again, they may want to fill you out before they tell you a lot about themselves. And so we have to be very careful with that because we can prescribe something to someone that can cause a flare up, right? Um, and, and so we always want to make sure we have that empathy piece first and being, you know, a brother or a sister in Islam, someone that, you know, will keep things confidential um, and professional. Um, and um and and to allow the person to be comfortable comfortable with you with trusting you with that uh, you know that great amina of 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 helping them in uh through a disease like this that can bring about a lot of shame so now let's talk about sweating and body odor so let's talk about the physiology of sweating and body odor. So sweating and body odor is common. It happens when we get too warm, maybe we're exercising, walking too fast. It can happen when we get angry, when we're feeling nervous, anxious, even stressed out. Um, the two major glands that are involved in sweating and body odor are our eccrine glands and also our apocrine glands. Now our eccrine glands occur over most of our body and they open directly onto the surface of our skin. So when our body temperature rises, these glands release fluids that cool our bodies down as they evaporate. Now, our apocrine glands, these are found in areas where we have hair. So, it, you know, we find these glands under our armpits and also in our groin area. Now, these glands release like a milky fluid when we're stressed out. And this fluid is odorless until it combines with bacteria on the skin. And that's what causes the body odor. So in these areas where we have hair, right, we want to pay particular and close attention to, you know, making sure that part of our body is clean. You know, we, we have these antiseptic herbs that kill these microorganisms right on the spot. So we want to make sure that that area is clean. But this is something so beautiful here and that this is part of the natural fitra of mankind and that Allah, he loves cleanliness and he loves beauty and cleanliness is is is, is half of our faith right? Being clean, being purified. And, you know, we know as Muslims, we're supposed to do what? Shave these areas that can cause odors to occur every 40 days. We're supposed to keep them nice, neat, and shaved so that we don't accumulate like dead scale cell, uh, cells in that area. Um, we're able to, you know, apply products to that area that will keep us smelling good. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved musk. He encouraged women who were having their menstrual cycles to apply musk right at the point of menstruation so not on the private part necessarily but in that area why because the body is impure at that point so even if you're shaved the body is still impure uh, sweating is occurring heat is happening down there because what's what's going on with the woman hormonally and also she is excreting waste right old blood from the body which we know carries its own harm and so keeping that that area not even though it's impure you know we can't even pray during that time but even though it's in that impure state smell is so important right in our religion um smells uh, ibn al-qayyum wrote about this in um Rahim Allah, he wrote about this in the medicine of the prophet and he talked about how um, smell, beautiful fragrances are a part of rukya. It's a part of healing, right? 
So very important to note here how just the, our natural fitra um, and, and what Allah tells us to do can, you know, reduce the amount of sweating and body odor, right? Because we think about, okay, well, sweating occurs when we're angry, stressed out. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, you know, through hadith of him giving advice to some of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, um, don't get angry. Don't get angry. Don't get angry. Allah tells us to, to forgive over and over, to pardon and overlook, to bear things with patience. We know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encouraged the, the believer not to get too happy about things, not to get too sad about things. Allah says it also in the Quran, you know, so that we don't we don't regret what passed us by and we don't overjoy, you know, we don't rejoice over what we've gotten. So we keep a mild temperament. And this causes homeostasis. It has the ability, you know, to help us regulate um, so many systems within the body, you know, but in particular, the integumentary system and keeping this body according to the correct fitra, right, and free of order. Right. We know even the angels love pleasant smells. You know, we know when we recite Quran, you know, the, the pleasant, beautiful recitation, along with this, the pleasantness, you know, of the breath, they come and place their mouths right over the person who's reciting their mouth. Right. But we know that they don't like pungent smells like garlic. You know, and even, you know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, has shown us that we even are supposed to stay for, away from the masjid until we rid our, you know, we rid that part of our body from that smell. So odor is very huge in Islam. So when we think about making Islamic medicine, I don't want you to, you know, I want you to know that um, all of the herbs are from Allah. We know this, but, you know, even if you made an, a deodorant, right? It doesn't necessarily have to have herbs that are specifically mentioned in hadith in it to be an Islamic medicine. The fact that it's made with herbs, which is from Allah's divine signs, alhamdulillah, right? His divine ayat. Because it just, it has, it contains that. It's natural. It's free of harmful toxins. And then on top of that, it's helping us keep with this fitra. Because some people, even though they shave in this area and keep themselves clean, they may just have a high metabolism or maybe doing work that requires a lot of physical exertion that they're going to sweat. Sweating is, is good for us, right? And so, and it's not that sweating is bad. We want to stop people from sweating. But Allah placed, placed herbs here, which we'll talk about some of them shortly, inshallah, that will help reduce the sweat and also that will help to keep the areas, even when we do sweat, right, free of bacteria and other microorganisms, right? And also that are pleasant and beautiful and smells like he loves, like the angels love, like Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved and help us stay pleasant and smell great, right? He's placed this here for us. So it's a very beautiful profession um, to be able to understand the mechanisms of disease and create products that help us maintain uh, the fitra and help us maintain a state of purity, right? And so Alhamdulillah, now we understand sweating and body odor better. Now let's take a deeper look at the herbs that we're covering this week. So let's take a deeper look at sage. So sage has a long history uh, of culinary use. So it's usually used as a food. One of the reasons for that is because it has a toxic constituent called thujone, which you can find in oil extracts, so infused oils. So if you're thinking about using sage topically, keep in mind that it's okay to make an infusion from it. However, it should not be ingested because of this toxic ketone called thujone. Now, med medicinal extracts for this reason are not recommended either. That's why it's good to look at this herb as, you know, a food as your medicine type of herb, right? You want to think about it as a tonic herb, 
which is an herb that has a great impact when you take small amounts of it over a long period of time. On top of that, using sage in your food um, is great because sage is a great source of calcium and iron, which most people are deficient of these two uh, minerals worldwide. Now, there are three major types of sage that are used uh, in culinary use and also for medicinal use. Let's go over a few of them now. The first is called Salvia pratensis. And the common name for this is clary sage, okay? So clary sage, especially in the essential oil form, has uh, found to be great for wound healing and also treating wound infections, staph infections. The next one is salvia lavendulifolia. Now, this is Spanish sage and if you pick up here this lavendulifolia um, at the end of this the name of sage um, it can give us some hints as to the major constituents this is a great sage to use for those nervine properties because it's it shares similar properties with lavender the next one is salvia officinalis. Now this is common sage. We can commonly find this uh, sage all around the world, but especially here in the US. Now common sage is the one that's spoken about in your herbal medicines textbook. So in the textbook, it doesn't necessarily cover um, the previous two types of sage. So just want you to keep in mind when you're reading, uh, you know, that it's covering common sage. And if you want to know more about the other different types of sages, there are some great resources online, one of which I've included as a handout in the download section for this week. Now, the essential oils are generally safe for topical use. So any one of these types of sage sages, the essential oil extracts are fine for topical use. Now, some of the herbal actions of the uh, essential oils um, are antispasmodic, antiseptic, astringent, antihydrotic, and also antimicrobial. Great herb for topical use. So now let's take a look at blue perum. So this herb is not found in your herbal medicines textbook. So I've included this awesome review article that was published in the Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology back in 2011. This review article is great because it gives you a nice history overview of this herb. Um, it also um, you know, talks about a lot of the traditional uses, which we'll talk about those in just a moment. Um, but in terms of the history, this herb has been widely used throughout Asia uh, over the last 2000 years. And as a result, there's been a lot of scientific uh, research done about it. So uh, scientific studies have been done um, Scientists have isolated uh, the constituents um, and secondary metabolites. They've actually researched how those constituents contribute to the herbal actions of this particular herb. And that is one of the reasons why you'll find, especially in traditional Chinese medicine, this is a staple herb that's used in a lot of different formulations because it has such a wide range of herbal uses um, and herbal actions. Now we're talking about the integumentary system this week. So some of the actions um, that this paper talks about is the anti-inflammatory actions, the anti-spasmodic actions, antimicrobial actions. Also one really good action that it goes into detail about, let's see if I can get to it. Uh, it talks about this Let's see, where is it? Yeah, here, down at the bottom of the page, the immunomodulatory act activity, which is huge when we think about those Langerhans cells, right? And when we think about possibly using um, this herb as a topical treatment for uh, ailments of the integumentary system. Again, um, it has uh, a whole lot of actions, um, anti-inflammatory, uh, anti-tumor, um, 
antiviral I mean the list goes on also wound healing so I definitely want you to take a look at this paper this week as a matter of fact this is a required uh, reading for this week so uh, again take your time and look through it what you're looking at for is all of the various actions um, and also some of these when it talks about the specific actions right it will give you dosage recommendations right and remember we're talking about topical use so um, I want you to definitely pay attention to that um, just for you know an example here I want to give you and that's why looking over these um, peer-reviewed research papers are highly beneficial uh, as a as an herbalist because um, you can find those dosages that's based upon science because sometimes when we look online we might run into you know a blog and they may not reference back where they're getting their dosages from but if you are going direct to the source to scientists who's actually studied these things for specific you know ailments and then they give you the dose that they use and furthermore they found that their study showed um, you know effects positive effects against a particular um, ailment then you know that this is the dosage that you want to stay in so again as an example antibacterial antifungal activity here you go up and it talks about um, you know in terms of um, streptococcus so a gram positive bacteria um, so this is the one that's responsible for like um, for, for MRSA and so it says that the values it was effective in these values so 0.25 slash uh, 0.50 milligrams and so you want to take a, a deeper look into this you want to see what form um, they used this urban whether they extracted a particular constituent and they're talking about this amount for the extraction there are conversions when we get into our dosage and formulations portions of our course or our curriculum rather um, where you can uh, say for instance a scientist has you know they have isolated a particular constituent and then they test that constituent on you know for certain ailment whether it's an animal whether it's you know just in cell cultures or whatever right there's a way that you can convert the whole plant right take the whole plant so you're not isolating we're not isolating as an herbalist but you can get the same dosage you know that they study by just isolating a constituent I hope that makes sense inshallah it'll make more sense when we get to our dosage and we really start studying that in detail but just know that that exists so when you see this research paper please research papers like this again pay attention to their dosages again pay attention to like what they're dosing if they're just doing a constituent that they're pulling out or if they're actually using the whole plant though so the, the crude herb and then you can kind of uh, do your you know have some idea in terms of dosage um, and also you can look at other online sources that are credible and that link back to peer-reviewed research so again this can be found in the download section of your um, of your class um, under this module for this week Okay, so again, review it. You'll see a lot of this information on your. So now let's talk about Lavendula angosfolia, lavender. Now this week we are talking about lavender essential oil, okay, and its major components. Now this is a great paper. This was actually recently published uh, and back in 2020, so just two years ago, in the Journal of Ethnopharmacology. And this is really great for what we're doing in this class um, to have some updated information and on top of that this paper talks about the anti serratic effect of lavender essential oil and also its major constituents that contribute to this anti serratic effect which are linalool and also linalil so this week we are going to be reading this 
paper um, because you won't find lavender in your herbal medicines textbook. So this is a great resource, an updated resource uh, about lavender essential oil. I'm so excited. I get so excited when I see recent research and I actually had to re reach out to one of the researchers. Um, so Vanit, the first researcher that you see here, um, because this is actually a paid, um, you know, you have to pay for some journals, journal articles, right? So this was actually paid. So I actually reached out um, and asked the one of the the authors for you know a copy of it and alhamdulillah they were able to give me a copy of this paper so um alhamdulillah for that i'm really excited for us to have that and um so this week we'll be learning about some of the actions of lavendula angosfolia for the integumentary system again this paper is all about psoriasis but it also touches on eczema it touches it touches on uh, also dermatitis um, some other actions of lavender essential oil that's mentioned in this paper is the um, wound healing um, also the anti-inflammatory effects of the oil um, and again it just lists a whole lot of beneficial information now not only did they do a uh, an experiment to uh, test out these major constituents and their anti psoriatic activity. Um, and they found that yes, um, lavender essential oil does have a positive, it does have that anti psoriatic activity, um, uh, at least in rats, anyways. So, um, so but uh, in addition to that, what they did, you know, as a part of their analysis, is they talked about all of the major compounds of lavender oil right and they listed them and this can be found on page i believe this is page five okay so you'll see this on page five um, but as you can see here in this column constituents as you can see um, the molecular formula which is something we don't really go into too much detail this in this course about that but at the end the last column you see the pharmacological activity so we see that there see the monoterpenoids they contribute to the anti-inflammatory um, and uh, effects and also that uh, linalol that we talked about earlier which is one of the major constituents that anti-inflammatory um, that pain relieving activity so this is really good I mean it's a whole list here as you can see so of just the compounds and it's great to be familiar with all of this now take your time the, this is the major portion of the paper that I really want you to pay attention to and sometimes when you're not used to reading studies like this a lot of this can just be like just boring but for this class what we really need to know is are the results uh, so this is on page seven you see the results so if you read the results and also you know you also read um on page 11 it it gives you a conclusion right so for what we're doing in this class those three sections are enough looking at the major constituents looking at the results of their study and also the conclusion now when we get into our research classes we're going to be reading these types of papers in detail because this information is super important um, when you think about using essential oils for your preparations I want you to refer back to your dilution charts okay that's it for uh, lavender and you'll see some of those questions on the now let's talk about time so time is remarkably similar to sage and that both of them are commonly used as culinary herbs so when you think about sage and thyme, think about food as your medicine think about tonic herbs so almost like sage the oil infusion of thyme is toxic when ingested however if you want to make an oil infusion of this herb it's all right if you're just using it to make a topical topicals made with thyme work great as long as you don't have an allergy uh, you know towards the herb now the herb is great for topical use you can use it as an antispasmodic uh, antimicrobial agent and also an astringent agent 
Now, even though the oil infusions are not recommended uh, to take internally, tea and extracts are safe. Again, you want to think about thyme and sage in the same category. You know, usually we have these things in our cabinet, which is right where they belong, you know, right b beside where we cook. And you want to think about them as food, as medicine. So you can learn a lot more about this herb in your herbal medicines textbook this week, pages 574 through 576. Please be sure to pay attention to its major constitu constituents, its dosage. Uh, for both the uh, tea and also liquid extract. Also, I want you to take a deeper look at the pharmacological studies and also the contraindications because that will be reviewed on your weekly assessment this week, inshallah. So last but not least, let's talk about tea tree oil. So tea tree, Melaleuca altenifolia. This is a awesome herb. Again, it's one of those uh, antiseptic herbs that kill uh, pathogens, you know, microbes on the spot. Um, this review article, I put this here in your download section. This is a required reading for this week because you won't find any information about tea tree in your herbal medicines textbook. So this week, just to be clear, we are talking about tea tree oil um, because that's really the only way to enjoy tea tree uh, because it's highly toxic when we ingest it. So a lot of times you'll, you'll read about actions uh, as it relates to using it topically. Um, if you look here, starting on pages 52 through about 59 it talks about the different actions so of, of you know a huge amount of actions for topical uh using this this oil topically um, to include antibacterial antifungal antiviral antimicrobial um, and also anti-inflammatory um, it also has some safety and toxicity data so it talks about the oral toxicity also the dermal toxicity you'll find that tea tree is sometimes used in like toothpaste natural toothpastes um, but there are usually there it's, it's usually used in very low dosages and there's usually like a safety um, you know, sticker or a statement on there about swallowing because it is very, very toxic when ingested. That's how strong it is. So that's how strong it is. So again, this is a required reading for this week. Um, when you pay it, when you read through it this week, right? I just want you to pay attention to the various actions and then I want you to take a look at the mechanisms of action as well. Uh, become familiar with them. Uh, because that's really uh, important here on page four this is a really good chart right here it tells you all of the uh, the types of bacteria um, that were tested against tea tree oil um, <clears throat> and had some effectiveness against those those particular uh, bacteria also same thing a list of fungi that was tested against tea tree oil and um and you know again all of these on this list um tea tree oil had uh you know action against those particular bacteria and fungi so just a great deal of beneficial information um, in this paper um, when you think about tea tree oil and dosing okay so be prepared for the test to be asked questions about dosing. Remember, we're talking about essential oil. So refer back this week to your dilution chart, okay? So go back through your um, through your notes, look for your dilution chart. I will include a dilution chart again in this week's um, sec sec um, download section for you. But if you like the ones that we've been using, then I would say refer to those. Again, I'll include something in your download section um, for you. But refer to that uh, for the questions about lavender oil dosing and also tea tree oil dosing for this week, inshallah. So let's talk about the required reading and test questions for your guidelines and fatwas textbook. Now, before we talk about this week's required reading and also test questions, I do want to make mention um, of something to you. Last week, you were giving readings and questions as well that were supposed to be, you know, 
listed on week nine's assessment. Unfortunately, because our assessment was too big, you know, the company, I reached out to them because it was just running really slow. As I'm entering the test questions, it's taking between three to five minutes for them to upload to the system. Well, long story short, I reached out to them and they just basically let me know that there's, you know, our assessment is huge. So it would be better to break the assessments into two parts and that way it could load quicker into the system. But instead of doing that, what I decided to do is just the questions from week nine from your guidelines and FATWA text, uh, textbook, you'll see it this week, okay, uh, inshallah, in addition to two more readings and test questions. So let's get to those now. So pages 125, 126, a question was asked to the sheikh or one of the sheikhs, is oil considered a barrier which prevents water from reaching the skin? Great question. You're going to be asked about that on the test. Also, you're going to need to know which sheikh made the fatwa, uh, Rahimullah. Also, number two, the ruling concerning creams that cover the skin. So you'll find that on page 132, 133. Our medicine making activity this week is bath teas. So back in 2019 was the last public speaking activity that I gave. And I was asked to come out to my alma mater, um, Virginia State University, and to give a lecture on spiritual baths spiritual herbal baths to be exact. Now, this was a lecture I had never given before, so I had to research. Um, I knew about spiritual baths because we have this in Islam. We have something called the Siddur bath, which I think I've mentioned to you all in previous uh, lectures before. And I have that information listed on how to do a Siddur bath on my website. Well, long story short, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recommended this bath to anyone who who's suffering from evil eye or, you know, some type of witchcraft uh, that's been performed on them as a way of lessening and curing the symptoms, right? And so this sitter bath uh, includes using, using sitter leaves and actually taking a bath with these herbs. So again, I give all the steps, um, but one thing that separates, you know, our baths as I learned by doing this research for this, you know, conference presentation is the Quran recitation over the bath before we actually take it, right? But Again, that was a beautiful, beautiful experience that I had learning about how spiritual baths um, and just herbal baths in general have this long traditional history. Um, as a matter of fact, some of the literature even dates back before ancient Rome and ancient Greece, um, even in ancient Egypt. Queen Nefertiti. She was said to have bathed in several different types of herbs and resins. So, you know, some of them included chamomile, frankincense, myrrh, and sometimes she would add milk and even honey into her baths. Uh, very wealthy people because they, they did this on a daily basis sometimes. So very interesting. But across various cu cultures um, as I've studied. And I wanna give this, this lecture again very soon, so keep your eye out. I might just pull it out and do a live lecture because it's really fascinating. Um, but again, across various cultures, spiritual baths are practiced um, Today, um, as many tribes in Africa and even some parts of India, they, you know, have bathing for women right before they get married and they use specific herbs and essential oils in those baths. Um, also, again, in Africa, um, what's very popular there is uh, the herbal bath for newborns as a means of strengthening their immune systems when they enter into our environment. So it's a way to welcome them into the world and also strengthen their immune system. Now, this has 
a lot to do when you think about spiritual baths now the scientific part of it a lot to do with something called percutaneous absorption um, also called dermal absorption which is basically um, the route by which substances enter into our body through the skin now water alone is not able to be absorbed through the skin because it's made of stratified squamous epithelium uh, which is impermeable however water can get into our cells and that's why when we sit in the bath too long sometimes you see how your hands will wrinkle up they look a little swollen and fat your feet tends to look that way as well and that's because the water can enter into our cells but it can't go beyond that it, you know it can't go beyond our uh, epithelium because or it can't be go, go be beyond our skin because it's just water and it does not have that ability to penetrate. So this is super important as it relates to percutaneous absorption or dermal absorption. So basically, this is the route by which substances enter into the body through the skin. So water alone does not have the ability to penetrate our skin. And that's because of how our skin, you know, is made. So our skin is made of stratified squamous epithelium, which is impermeable. So water cannot enter it. Um, however, water can enter into our cells. That's why if you sit in a bathtub too long, you notice how your fingers are little, you know, look a little fat and kind of wrinkly. Um, also, your feet can look like that as well. And that's because the water has entered into the cells, but it, they, it doesn't go any further than that. It can't go into circulation and in, into our body. Um, but uh, research has shown that certain plant extracts, right, like coffee, avocado oil, chamomile, um, essential oils like peppermint um, can actually be absorbed through the skin. So can cause transdermal absorption. Thus, we have science kind of catching up with this long traditional use. Like the people who lived before us, they knew this, right? Um, and they perhaps, Allah knows best, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, have the scientific microscopic kind of research um, to validate what they were doing, but they knew that it worked. They knew that it worked as a preventative treatment for disease and also as an intervention uh, treatment. Uh, because when we look into, and, and this is a, a lecture that I would love to dig up and, and give really soon because it's just really fascinating. But when we look into the history of herbal baths, right, we see that so many uses i mean it can be used to re relieve fever uh, reduce fever um, also quick acting for uh, muscle pain joint pain um, it's particularly really good to be used for autoimmune disorders because there are scientific studies that show that just baths by themselves without the you know herbal interventions have therapeutic effects uh, because, you know, for one, it's been found that heating inc increases this transdermal um, absorption. So, and then the heating of the water as well is very soothing and calmative to the nervous system. Um, it has a whole lot of other, you know, uh, physiological benefits. Um, but for people with autoimmune disorders, we know that it's an immune system problem and also a nervous system problem. So just the fact that they're bathing, for one, is a de-stressor because we know that stress is a trigger um, for autoimmune um, relapses. And so, um, but when you add herbs in there, like calmative herbs, immunomodulatory herbs, it becomes this holistic treatment, right? And then Islam, we have something that other religions don't have. We have the, like, the recitation over water, which we know that we can, it's permissible for us to do that so you know we have so many benefits in islamic medicine when we you know apply it and we actually use it in this uh in this in this way for you know herbal baths right um and again this is science kind of catching up with this long traditional use validating this long traditional use and even though this paper which i will uh, leave a link to this paper in your um in your uh, class description for this week. I'll leave it that there. Um, but 
this paper talks about just a few herbs, but there's so much other research that shows this transdermal absorption by other plant extracts. Um, so, you know, take your time, research if this is an area that you might be interested in getting into, or if you just one day, you know, decide to open up a clinical practice, which I hope that you uh, choose to do, um, then you'll know that this is a you know, when you do your client assessments and you kind of think about what your client needs and a developing a regimen that they'll be able to stick to, you know, is this, does this person, are they, do they currently bathe? Is bathing something that they, they like to do or even physically able to do? And then you can kind of be thinking about different products and different designs of products to get, and the goal is to deliver this medicine into the body. So again, a link will be to this, uh, to this article in your download section, inshallah. So a great resource that I want to introduce you to, one of two rather, is um, this is uh, hosted by the CDC, so the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Even though I'm not fully a fan of the CDC, the good research, the good science that they do is very beneficial for helping us understand uh, pathogenesis and also the pathophysiology of certain disease. So on their website, um, they also oversee the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And so they have this resource on their page where they talk about uh, skin exposures to various occupational um, chemicals. So a person who works, say, in a plant, um, in a paint factory, right? They're going to be exposed to uh, very chemicals that a normal person working in a grocery store will not necessarily come into contact with day to day. Usually employers are supposed to enact different methods to protect their employees uh, against being exposed to chemicals. So maybe um, arm lift gloves or certain clothing or um, safety goggles, helmets, uh, on and on. But sometimes what happens is uh, maybe there's negligence on the employer's part. Maybe there's negligence on the um, the employee's part, or maybe just accidents happen sometimes. So again, um, to train employees and employers on how serious uh, trans transdermal uh, absorption is, they've created this resource just to show people how serious, um, you know, these, you know, being exposed to harmful chemicals can be for the skin. Um, Again, we can find this in many different sectors. We can find this in the food service sector, cosmetology, healthcare, um, painting, construction, on and on and on. But what I wanted you to see from this resource is um, they talk about dermal absorption, right? And they go into the dynamics of dermal absorption, how it actually happens, like the different pathways, right? Um, how it occurs. Um, this absorption occurs through diffusion, which is, you know, the molecule spread from areas of high concentration to areas of low con concentration. And they talk about these three mechanisms by which chemicals diffuse into the skin um, or these proposed mechanisms. So not necessarily uh, confirmed through science, but just theoretically how this happens. Now, even though they're talking about harsh toxic chemicals right we can also when we're reading this material keep in mind that this we this this model right of of uh, transdermal or dermal absorption uh, can be used when we think about you know how herbs and other plant medicine like essential oils may pass through and be absorbed through the skin. So again, a great resource. I'll leave this here. This is a required reading. Just the section here, right when it's talking about dermal absorption, what it is, some um, proposed mechanisms of how it actually happens. I want you to study that. And again, I want you to keep in mind that we're talking about herbal medicine here and that this could be the science 
of how it happens um, when we use herbs and essential oils, which, you know, we have recent articles like the one that I just showed you that kind of confirms this. But what, what scientists like to do often is they like to um, be very specific. So in that particular article, they're talking about just a few different types of herbs and essential oils. Again, cam um, chamomile, um, peppermint oil, and so on. And there's also studies on uh, um, castor oil, which we've talked about before. So we know that is deep penetrating as well. Um, but we can, again, we can think about, you know, all herbs that's not irritating to the skin, possibly having this ability and depending on the dosage um, for that. So that is in your uh, readings, uh, required reading list for this week. So this is another resource that's hosted on the NIH's website under the National Cancer Institute. And this is part of their SEER training modules. So they train um, you know, employees and practitioners about different types of cancer. Now in this module, they're talking about melanoma, um, but they have an awesome anatomy of the skin uh, uh, module within their uh, their uh, module for melanoma. So in this section, again, for those of you who want to learn more and get some deeper insight into the skin, um, or if you just want to have some stuff printed, because I know the Khan Academy video videos, they reviewed a lot, um, but unless you took notes, you could have missed some things, you might want to print this out. Um, this, again, a great resource telling you about the different layers of skin, the cells found within those layers of skin, um, where blood vessel, the hair follicles, the sweat glands are located, where we can find nerve endings. I mean, just on and on and on and on. Um, something else, um, it has a whole list of where we can find lymph nodes. Um, so, you know, where they can be found, their primary site, and the re regional lymph nodes that's found at those sites. So again, just a very beneficial resource. I will include a link under your supplementary readings um, section for this week.
So how do we make bad teas? It's very simple. We've actually discussed this before when we talked about making um, a regular tea that we would ingest internally. So we make it with the same proportions, either one ounce of herbs to 32 ounces of water. However, remember this is a bath. So a person could either boil their tea before and then enter it into an existing bath, such as the one on the screen, so that they, they're getting the herbal uh, constituents in there and they can add in their natural soap of choice. Or you can choose to make a tea bag that they can put into the water. Um, you'll see if you go online and just do a quick search of bath teas, uh, different companies offer them in different forms. So I've seen like the loose teas, um, people will sell them in just like craft bags right or, or they will sell them in glass jars and it's just like loose tea that people can scoop out and put into their bath water. Some people will use the bag, uh, the bags like I have here on the screen. Um, it really just depends on the company, um, but I do like to use the bags myself because what I found is that when you just dump the herbs into a bath, right? You don't pre-boil the water and then dump it into the water or use a bath a tea bag. It will sometimes cause drain difficulties. And, you know, when you get into the clinical portion, you'll learn that a lot of clients, they are very particular on things interrupting their life. Um, so think about how you would like it. You know, I always tell my students this, when you're designing product, always think about you first, you. Think about what you would like. So the question this week is, how would you like to take your bath tea? Would you like to, you know, have the, 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 the nice ambiance of nice and warm water with your herbs infusing in the water as you sit in it and you're able to look at the herbs and feel them and, you know, you can actually use them as exfoliation agents too and rub them on your skin. Yeah, that's, that's, people enjoy to use it like that or would you prefer to just get the medicinal use out of it and put it in a bag and and reduce the mess and the cleanup later how would you like to do it so think about that and um, again think about when you're coming up with your proportions with bath teas you can use essential oils you can use the dry herbs right you can like squirt a little of your essential oils over your dry herbs right, for your, your bath tea. So you have these tools. You learned about, you know, um, tea infusions back in IH 101. Um, this is going to be on your test, so make sure you review that information. If you um, forgot, if you haven't been making teas and utilizing your knowledge, go back and review. Um, and also um, review, again, your dilution chart. Um, so when you're designing your medicine this week, you can know that, you know, how many drops you would need to use per, you know, however strong you want your um, bath tea to be. So that is it for bath teas. I hope you enjoyed learning about bath teas um, as much as I like talking about it. And um, that's it for the lecture this week. So let's go over your homework assignments really quickly. So you have your herbal readings, um, your medicine making activity, which is optional. You also have your reflections post um, as usual. So each student is required to write a summary of one topic covered in our weekly lesson. Again, it can include poetry, a video, or some other work that you've cho chosen to cover. Also, don't forget to comment on three classmates post and that is required for full credit until next week inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh